Well, good morning. It's really a privilege to be with you this morning, and I get to share uh, and preach from the Word today. Uh, we just read 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 11. I recommend that if you have a copy of God's Word today with you to open that up to 2 Corinthians. We're going to refer back to it a lot, so it won't always be on the screen when we want to look at it. Uh, so start turning there. Just a little bit of background on our family, if you don't know us. Uh, my name is John. My wife is Jess. We live in East Asia in a really big city. Uh, we have four kids, and I'm a PhD student at a university in that city, uh, finishing up, trying to finish up uh, my degree there. Uh, we've been in that city for five years, um, and we were, we were sent out from FBC. We lived in Longview before that. And it really is a privilege to be here. Uh, the passage this morning that we're going to read, or that we just read and that we're going to study this morning, has been really helpful for me and for my wife over the last um, several months to a year. Uh, we have a 10-month-old, and uh, for my wife, pregnancy is very difficult. She has a lot of morning sickness, which is mainly just like all-day sickness, pretty much the entire time. Um, it's really difficult. And then with our, with our fourth baby, she had a problem with her mouth where she was not eating right. So she wasn't gaining weight like she needed to. It was really difficult for my wife. She felt like maybe she's doing something wrong. Maybe there's something wrong with her. Maybe we don't know what to do. And this is our fourth kid. We thought we might have some things figured out. It was a very stressful time for my wife. During the, around that same time, we were also facing some financial difficulty. I was spending a lot of time trying to raise more support uh, from overseas, which is difficult to do, and was seeing very little success from that. I realized through that process that really what was happening was God was preparing me for, uh, he, was, he was showing me that uh, I really wanted to do that uh, fundraising so that I could have glory, and I wanted to steal that from him. During this time also, as I was doing this PhD program, I found out that the requirements for my program might have changed a little bit, and it might be diff more difficult for me to graduate. I'm so tired of school. I've been doing this now for five years, and I really want to be done. And it looked like I might need to do it another year, do a whole other project, do another year worth of school. Well, then a few weeks later, after praying about it with our church there, we found out, no, actually in a couple months, I might have all the requirements finished, and it could be done. So it went from super long to really short. It felt like the, uh, the old school windows when you're downloading something and it says, oh, it's going to take two hours. No, it's going to take six days. No, it's going to take 30 seconds. <laughs> if you're in your 20s and below, you probably don't understand that. But if you're a little bit older, then you understand this. So that's what I felt like with my PhD program trying to finish up. I really wanted to get done. Um, and so it was all around. I was really stressed. But both of us read 2 Corinthians individually um, during that time. And it was a real comfort to us. It was very helpful for us. And so this passage is, is meaningful, and so I want you to know that before we dive in. But let's get into it. We're going to read it one more time. Uh, we'll probably read it in parts even more than one more time, but we're going to read it again. So this is 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 through 11. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. You also must help us by prayer so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. So a little bit of context to this verse, Paul, along with Timothy, is writing a second letter to the church in Corinth and the surrounding area. A few things that we notice as we read this is a lot of repetition. You can see that share bring, comes up a lot, sharing and the concept of sharing. Comfort is mentioned 10 times. Affliction, suffering, and things similar to that are also mentioned 10 times throughout this verse. 
uh, throughout these verses. Also notice in verse 3, it says that uh, the Father of mercies, God of all comfort. It says God of all comfort. It does not say that this is a comfortable God. We're not serving a comfortable God. Jesus calls people in this way in Luke. says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. So the Christian life is not meant to be comfortable, but we do have a comforter. So if you're taking notes today, which I recommend that you do, I'm going to give you a one-sentence summary of this passage. It's a, uh, an overall meaning that you can write down to help us understand what's going on here. So I'll give it to you two times. I think it's on the screen as well. You can write it down. So here it is. As God shares comfort with his followers who are sharing in Jesus' afflictions, they are driven to rely on God and others are compelled to praise him. I'll read it one more time. As God shares comfort with his, belie- with his followers who are sharing in Jesus' afflictions, they are driven to rely on God and others are compelled to praise him. And today I want to give you, go ahead and give you my three points from the outline and then we'll discuss each, three, each of the three points. First point is the affliction comfort connection. Second, rely on God who raises the dead. And third, share so many will give thanks. So start with number one, the affliction comfort connection. If we look at uh, verses four through seven again, it says that God of all comforts, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. And we can see as we read through here, there's a, there's a back and forth between comfort and affliction comfort and affliction. And we see this connection throughout this first section. So what is this affliction that it's talking about? What is, what is affliction? So verse 4 says that God covers us in all affliction, and it equips Paul to comfort someone in any affliction. So what is it? Well, we know that we live in a broken world, and we deal with the effects of sin. Todd talked about this a few weeks ago. He said that we are all sinners We're under the curse of sin, and we deal with those consequences daily. So we sin, and then we face the consequences of those of our sins. We reap what we sow. And then we also have some residual effects. We deal with disease, sickness, and death. We know that we're going to die. And we also deal with the death of loved ones, which is incredibly difficult and a result of sin. We also deal with the sin of others. People sin against us. Many of us have been abused or neglected, attacked in some way, betrayed, gossiped about. We know what it's like to deal with the sin of others as well. This is, a, this is part of that any and all affliction. There's also a affliction that is, we term persecution. So persecution is being treated poorly or abused for our faith in Jesus. I don't know if you guys heard our, uh, we did a, a moment uh, a few weeks ago, and in that we shared about our, uh, on Mother's Day, just a few months ago, we had 11 policemen show up to the hotel where our church was meeting, and they wanted to shut us down. And they said that uh, we were able to finish our service, but they had everyone register. We, everyone had to put down their name and passport number and information. And they said that it was illegal for us to meet in the way we were meeting. As a, as a church, we needed to register. And with that registration meant we had to give away some control and some oversight in what was actually preached and taught. And they also said that we could not have a mix of foreigners and local people worshiping together, that that was illegal. So we had some persecution. This is definitely uh, persecution, as that's termed. It's uh, affliction. And from that, our church had to scatter, so into multiple meetings throughout the city. Um, And then when we go back in just a few weeks, uh, we're going to partner with two other families, and we're actually going to plant a new church in our area. Um, So we can see, even in ourselves, that this this persecution that we're facing is, is serving to encourage us and embolden us to continue, uh, to continue to move forward. But that's an example of persecution. Um, And then another affliction is also sacrifices. 
So we've made sacrifices to live cross-culturally. It's not comfortable for us. We would not pick to live there. Um, but we're there because God wants us to be there. And it also impacts our family and our friends here. So people here sacrifice for us to be there. Our family sacrifices because we're not here. We have four kids, so grandparents sacrifice a lot that we are not close and really not reachable. I mean, we're a 15-hour plane ride away that's not comfortable uh, to be able to connect easily. So they're sacrificing as well. So let's continue to look at the affliction, comfort, connection. Look at verse 5. It says, for we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. And we see this again. So we're talking about Christ's sufferings now, not just sharing with one another, but sharing in Christ's sufferings and also sharing in comfort through Christ. We know that Christ suffered. He was betrayed by his follower. He was beaten. He was crucified. And he took all of God's wrath on himself. So he definitely, definitely suffered and also note the order of the suffering and the comfort. So suffering comes first. First we share in sufferings, then we share in comfort. Right, let's take a, verse, a look at verse 6. 6 and 7. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. There again, the back and forth. The suffering comes first, and then the comfort. And also, notice he says patient endurance. It sounds a lot like James 1 that says, count it all joy when you face trials of various kinds. I think we need to confess that oftentimes we miss this affliction, comfort, connection. Uh, we really want to usurp the affliction and just get the comfort. So we do things on our own. We try to eliminate God from the process and gain some sort of counterfeit comfort that brings us a sense of comfort, but is not actually what God has planned for us. So what are some ways that we do this? Uh, we might want to remove a, a affliction, mask it, numb it, avoid it in some way. So some examples might be food. So we eat a lot. We stress eat. Uh, what about drinking or drugs? Or binge watching on Netflix. Uh, some of us for work is a release or a, a numbing of the pain of life because we can just work harder, put our head down, and we don't have to think about other things. Sometimes we try to control circumstances or control people. We might gossip about someone, slander, put them down so that we feel better about ourselves. Uh, this is a good one for me, humor. So I use humor um, sometimes in not a good way. I uh, try to be funny or try to mask a awkward or painful time by saying something funny because if we can laugh, then we don't have to think about that something hurts. There's other escapes that we have. I'm sure we could go on and on and list those. Also, bad theology. Sometimes we mask. We want comfort to know that we want to think that God wants us to be happy. And God doesn't want us to be happy. He wants us to be holy. It's much better than happiness. He wants us to be holy, and that's what he's pursuing, and we're going to get into that more as we go through these verses. So what's the comfort that God shares with us? He shares his comfort. What is that comfort? What does that actually look like? So one of the things is God's presence. Matthew 1, talking about Jesus coming to the world, says, they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. So God is with us. Uh, 2 Corinthians 6, 16, Adam preached on this just a few weeks ago. I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. How great is that that God is going to be our God and that he wants us to be his people? That's amazing. He's the God of the universe. He made everything. He's huge. He doesn't need us, but he wants to be with us, and he wants us to be his people. And lastly, Matthew 28, 20, which is the great commission, Jesus says, And behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. Another way that we see in verse 10 of this section, uh, of, of this passage, is the hope for deliverance. So let's look at verse 10. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. So there is hope for deliverance Paul's talking about. So that's one way that God shares comfort. We have hope. 
that he will deliver us again. So what's an application for this point? When life gets hard, where do you run for comfort? Are you looking for counterfeit comforts? Or are you looking for a comfort from the Lord? And what might, life, what might your life look like if you shared in Christ's sufferings? That's something to chew on, something to think about as you go home, as you talk over lunch. So the first one was the, applica- the affliction, comfort, connection. Uh, point two, rely on God who raises the dead. Let's look at verses 8 through 10. For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. So this is the point, rely on God who raises the, the dead. So the author here, Paul and Timothy, they, were, they had a near-death experience. They thought they were going to die. They assumed this is the end. This must be it. Uh, that's, that's a pretty dark place. That's a very low place. And we see a similar scenario in Exodus when the people of uh, when, when the Israelites were leaving Egypt, they were at the edge of the Red Sea, and the Egyptian army was coming to chase them down, and they thought they were going to die. And they said, why did we even come out here? We should have just died, and we could have been slaves in Egypt instead of dying in the wilderness. But Moses told them, he said, fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord. So God did for Israel what he also is doing for Paul here. Brought him to a place of near death, so that they would rely on him. It wasn't a place of near death so that they were punished. It wasn't out of punishment that he was doing this. It was out of love for them. He wanted them to rely on him. He knew that was the best place for them. Now, verse 9 says, to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. I think we can quickly just gloss over raises the dead, but we need to, we need to wait a second. For many of us who have been in church for a while, it's very easy, easy for us to, to pass over the, the resurrection. It's like, yeah, yeah, we, we know that. We've heard it a lot. But we can't forget that this is a huge deal. Raising from the dead is not normal. It's not typical, and it's not a common thing. This is very uncommon. The resurrection changes everything. You know, the Bible says that we, that we have a problem, and that problem is that we are sinners. We're under a curse from sin, and because of this curse, We're slaves to sin and fear. We are spiritually dead. But God has provided a way for us to be reconciled to him through the death and resurrection of his son, Jesus. We receive God's free gift of salvation by repenting of our sins, believing in Jesus, and following him. Baptism, which Jordan talked about earlier, there's going to be a baptism service in a couple of weeks. Baptism is a picture of this. Being in the water is to represent being dead and raised, and the, the raising out of the water is the picture of the resurrection. This is a big deal. This is a huge change. It's not going from being sick to well, which is also a metaphor for salvation, but the seriousness of it, of it is, like in Ephesians 2, it says, you were dead in the trans- trespasses and sins in which you once walked, but God made us alive together with Christ. So when we rely on God, we remember that he's raised us from the dead, for those of us who are Christians who believe. All right, next, notice in verse uh, 10, he goes from uh, past tense to to future tense. So he delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. We have set our hope, we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. He says twice here that he will deliver us. We're looking forward. So this is something that the Israelites never understood, and they had a hard time with, especially when they were in the wilderness. God kept reminding them over and over and over again, remember that I brought you out of Egypt. You were once slaves, and I set you free. I brought you out of Egypt. And then you're going to the promised land. Remember where you're going. So this is a a theme throughout the Bible, is to look back, remember what God has done for us. Not forget it, not gloss over it, but remember what he's done. And then also look forward to what he's saving us to. Where are we going? And that's eternity with him in heaven. Deuteronomy 6, as the Israelites are moving toward the promised land, God told them, he said, when you eat and are full, 
Take care lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. So we don't want to forget what God has done for us. So I mentioned earlier about we had some financial issues uh, last fall. It looked like we wouldn't have enough money to continue. And I considered quitting my PhD program and starting some work uh, so that we could make some money. We were encouraged to stick with the PhD program, but to reach out to uh, a lot of people and ask them to, to help us with a lump sum goal uh, of financial support that would help us to continue so that I would be freed up to finish my PhD. So we did this, and by God's grace, he provided all the money that we needed in 40 days, and it was, it was tw- about $25,000 that we needed to be able to continue. Um, and it really taught me it was good for me because I had very little to do with it. My wife, Jess, wrote the email. Um, I think I hit send on MailChimp, and that was it. And then God provided all of this. And I had worked so hard to raise all this support for months. I had worked hard, but I was trying to do it for my own glory. And God did it very quickly, and I had nothing to do with it. So I give him all the glory for that. But I read this, and I think, I feel like I was at least in a place where I felt dead financially. I wasn't sure how to bring in more money or how to cut where we could have, we spend less money. It it seemed like I was dead financially, and I didn't really know what to do. And God used that. That served to help me to rely on God. So when we come back this summer, and we're doing a little more support raising, and we're looking to the fall, uh, because that lump sum that we had was supposed to last us through August, and August is almost done, and now we're looking to the future at what's next. And I'm still not quite done with my PhD, uh, it seems like I've been doing that for like two years now. And so, so what, what happens next? But can we rely on God? But I can look back and know, you know what? God provided in an awesome way. I know that I can trust him to provide for the future. He will deliver us. He will provide for us. We believe that God has directed us to where we live, and we can go back to that. And we say, God, we believe you've directed us here. Please provide. But it's also good for my heart to remember that he provided, and it's, and it's not me. So how do we apply this? How do we rely on God for all comfort, the God who raises the dead? Now, some of you might say that, you know, it's really easy for me to say, yeah, you were dead financially, but that's not really that big of a deal. It's not physical. It's not some of the things I've been through. And you're right, I don't know everything that everyone here has been through, and I'm not going to pretend that I do. But I do know that there are so many people in Scripture that have faced affliction, persecution, abuse. And we can also see from Scripture how God comforted them and took care of them. So, for example, God drove the Israelites into the wilderness, uh, drove them to rely on him while they were in the wilderness. Uh, First Kings talks about uh, God using Elijah to save a widow and her son from starvation. And later the son dies from a disease and Elijah raises him from the dead. Psalms really captures David's reliance on God as he faces death from from many foes, from many directions. Jesus, for example, he lived a perfect life. He was betrayed by his friends. He suffered a severe beating. He was crucified on a cross. Isaiah says he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. I would guess some of us here feel at least some of that, that we have been despised and rejected, full of sorrow and acquainted with grief. Also, Paul, we can see in 2 Corinthians 4, he talks about all the things that he went through. But his hope is on the Lord. His hope is on the future. He's looking forward to that. Another few good examples I'll give you, you can maybe Google these people. They're uh, more closer to our timeline. C.S. Lewis talks a lot about suffering. He's been through a lot. Um, Johnny Erickson Tata, I read a little bit about her just recently. And uh, she has been through a lot, suffers daily from physical ailments. Paul David Tripp also uh, wrote a book on suffering, and he had to go through a lot of suffering to be able to write a book on suffering. Those who rely on God, those who rely on God for the, follow the formula that's in verse 10, which is looking back at what God has saved us from and then looking forward at what he's saving us to. So God has saved us from sin. He has raised us from the dead. And he's saving us to eternity with him in heaven. So I want to challenge you. uh, 
as you, as you leave here today, consider all that God's done for you, starting with Jesus. And if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, then find out how to get to that point. And consider how, where he's leading you to, and that's to heaven. Also consider 2 Corinthians 4, for this light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. So finally, I have one more point. Share so many will give thanks. This is basically a point of application. We get this from verse 11. You also must help us by prayer so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. So God calls us to share with other people, and the result is that everyone glorifies God. We see the sharing throughout these verses, four, five, six, seven, eight, all talk about sharing. Prayers by the afflicted for the afflicted result in comfort for all through Christ. So we want prayers by the afflicted for the afflicted. So we're all sharing in that together. Sharing is the catalyst for reaching comfort. So how did the Corinthian church pray for Paul? No, to pray for Paul, they didn't know what's happening with him. He, had, he told them. He let them know. He says in verse 8, For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers. So the application for us from that is to share with others in gospel community. So the affliction that we face is good for us. It, it drives us to rely on God. It's also good for others so that other people will give thanks. So don't waste that affliction by hiding and not sharing. Talk to people about your struggles, and it's okay to show weakness. Read about Paul. He talked about how he boasts in his weakness. That's very important. And then there's another side to that same coin of sharing our afflictions and our struggles is listening to other people's struggles and weaknesses and being okay with that. So we need to learn to listen well. We don't want to fix or fix immediately, but we want to listen and then pray. That's the guidance we get here. Paul's telling them and asking them, help us by prayer. It's prayer that these things are accomplished, that we get to see God's comfort come to light through these things, not by fixing or changing circumstances. So this, pa this passage points to our need for gospel community. I challenge you to be a member of a gospel-believing church uh, because it's really easy to hide if you're not. And also as a member of a gospel-believing church, do your part in sharing about what's going on and about how God has comforted you. And also do your part in asking people how they're doing, how they're struggling, and pray for them. So the, the takeaway or the, the challenge for today is to ask a friend what they're struggling with, what's difficult for them. Um, don't try to fix it when they tell you. Don't make recommendations. But start off with praying for them. So as we close... Let's remember the overall meaning of the passage that I gave you earlier. As God shares comfort with his followers who are sharing in Jesus' afflictions, they are driven to rely on God and others are compelled to praise him. So may God grant us a life of sharing with Christ and with his people to his praise and glory. Let's pray. God, we thank you that we can read your word this morning. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the comfort that you provide as the God of all comfort. God, we pray that we would rely on you, that we put away counterfeit comforts and lean into your promises to comfort us as we trust you in the afflictions and the struggles that we face. God, we pray that we would be part of sharing in community with others praying for those in affliction and sharing our own afflictions and victories and comforts that you provide. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.